Section 10 of Aids to Forensic Medicine and Toxicology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden. Aids to Forensic Medicine and Toxicology by W. G. Aitchison Robertson. Section 10. Part 2. Toxicology. 1. Definition of a Poison. Though the law does not define in definite terms what a poison really is, it lays stress on the malicious intention in giving a drug or other substance to an individual. It is a felony to administer, or cause to be administered, any poison or other destructive thing with intent to murder, or with the intention of stupefying or overpowering an individual, so that any indictable offense may be committed. It is a misdemeanor to administer any poison, or destructive or noxious thing, merely to aggrieve, injure, or annoy an individual. For a working definition, we may state that a poison is a substance which, when introduced into or applied to the body, is capable of injuring health or destroying life. A poison may therefore be swallowed, applied to the skin, injected into the tissues, or introduced into any orifice of the body. 2. Sale of Poisons, Scheduled Poisons The sale of poisons is regulated by various acts, but chiefly by the Pharmacy Act, 1868, and by the Poisons and Pharmacy Act, 1908. Only registered medical practitioners and legally qualified druggists are permitted to dispense and sell scheduled poisons. They are responsible for any errors which may be committed in the sale of poisons. If a druggist knows that a drug in a prescription is to be used for an improper purpose, he may refuse to dispense it. The practitioner who carelessly prescribes a drug in a poisonous dose is not held responsible, but the dispenser would be if he dispensed it and harmful or fatal consequences followed on its being swallowed. When a dispenser finds an error in a prescription, it is his duty to communicate with the prescriber privately, pointing out the mistake. A great responsibility rests on the medical man who does his own dispensing, as there is no one to check his work. If a doctor prescribes a drug with the intention of curing or preventing a disease, but that, contrary to expectation and general experience, it causes illness or even death, no responsibility can rest with the prescriber. It has to be proved that actual injury has been sustained by the complainant before an action for damages can be commenced and that the plaintiff was free from all contributory negligence. Scheduled Poisons By the Pharmacy Act of 1868, two groups of poisons are scheduled. Part 1 contains a list of those which are considered very active poisons, that is, arsenic, alkaloids, belladonna, cantharides, coca, if containing more than 1% alkaloids, corrosive sublimate, diacalon, cyanides, tartar emetic, ergot, Nux vomica, laudanum, opium, savin, picrotoxin, veronal, and all poisonous urethanes, prussic acid, vermin killers, etc. Such poisons must not be sold to strangers, but only to persons known to or introduced by someone known to the druggist. If sold, the latter must enter into the poison register the name of the poison, the name of the person to whom it is sold, the quantity and purpose for which it is to be used, and date of sale. The entry must be signed by the purchaser and by the introducer. The word poison must be affixed to the bottle or package, and also the name and address of the seller. Part 2 contains a list of poisons supposed to be less active. These may only be sold if, on the bottle, box, or package, there is affixed a label with the name of the article, the word poison, and the name and address of the seller. It is not necessary to enter the transaction in a register. Chemists are required to keep poisons in specially distinguishable bottles, and these in a special room or locked cupboard. Dangerous Drugs Act, 1920 The regulations restrict the manufacture and sale of opium, morphine, cocaine, and heroin, so as to prevent their abuse. Preparations containing less than one-fifth percent of the first two, or less than one-tenth percent of the last two, are excluded. Prescriptions containing the above drugs must be dated and signed with the full name and address of the prescriber, and must have also those of the patient. The total amount of the drug to be supplied must be stated, and it must not be dispensed more than once. The dispenser retains the prescription. 
Special books must be kept recording the purchase and sale of these drugs. Proprietary Medicines Bill, introduced in 1920, and likely soon to become law. The sale of any unregistered proprietary medicine purporting to cure certain diseases or produce abortion is made an offense. A register of proprietary medicines, etc., is established. The object is to protect the public against quack remedies. Notification of Poisoning Every case of poisoning which occurs in any industry, lead, arsenic, anthrax, etc., must be notified by the medical attendant to the Chief Inspector of Factories, Factory and Workshops Act, 1895. 3. Action of Poisons, Classification of Poisons Action of Poisons They may act either locally or only after absorption into the system. 1. Local action, as seen in a. Corrosive poisons b. Irritant poisons, causing congestion and inflammation of the mucous membranes, for example, metallic and vegetable irritants c. Stimulants or sedatives to the nerve endings, as aconite, conium, cocaine 2. Remote action This may be of reflex character, as seen in the shock produced by the pain caused by corrosive poisons, or the poison may exert a special action on certain structures, as belladonna on the cells of the brain, strychnine on the motor nerve cells of the spinal cord. 3. In both ways. Certain poisons, as carbolic or oxalic acids, act in this way. Age, idiosyncrasy, tolerance, and disease all exert modifying influences on the action of a poison. The form in which the poison is swallowed and the quantity also determine its action. In the gaseous form, poisons act most rapidly and fatally. When in solution and injected hypodermically, they also act very rapidly. In the solid form, they act, as a rule, slowly, and may even set up vomiting, and so may be entirely ejected by vomiting. Poisons act most energetically when the stomach is empty. If taken when the stomach already contains food, solution and absorption may be greatly delayed. Some poisons are cumulative in their action, and thus, even if infinitesimal doses be swallowed each day, there is a certain amount of storage in the tissues, though a certain percentage of the poison is being constantly eliminated, and at last symptoms of poisoning show themselves. Classification of Poisons as an aid to memory, the following classification is perhaps the best. 1. Inorganic. Sub-1. Corrosive acids and alkalis, and caustic salts, carbolic and oxalic acids also. Sub-2. Irritant. Practically all the metals and the metalloids. Iodine, chlorine, bromine, phosphorus. 2. Organic. Sub-1. Irritant. Animal. Venomous bites. Food poisoning. Cantharides. Vegetable. All strong purgatives. Hellebores, savin, yew, ergot, hemlock, laburnum, bryony, etc. Sub 2. Neuronic. A. Somniferous, opium and its alkaloids. B. Deliriant. Belladonna, hyoscyamus, stramonium, cannabis, cocaine, cocculus, camphor, fungi. C. Inebriants. Alcohol, ether, chloral, carbolic acid, weak, benzol, aniline, nitroglycerin. Sub 3. Sedative or depressant. A. Neural, conium, lobelia, tobacco, physostigma. B. Cerebral, hydrocyanic acid. C. Cardiac, aconite, digitalis, colchicum, veratrum. Sub 4. Excitomotory or convulsives. Nux vomica, strychnine. Sub 5. Vulnerance. Powdered glass. 3. Asphyxiants. Poisonous and irrespirable gases. 4. Evidence of poisoning. It may be inferred that poison has been taken from consideration of the following factors. Symptoms and post-mortem appearances. Experiments on animals chemical analysis, and the conduct of suspected persons. 1. Symptoms in poisoning usually come on suddenly, when the patient is in good health, and soon after taking a meal, drink, or medicine. Many diseases, however, come on suddenly, and in cases of slow poisoning the invasion of the symptoms may be gradual. 2. 
Post-mortem appearances. These, in many poisons and classes of poisons, are characteristic and unmistakable. The post-mortem appearances peculiar to the various poisons will be described in due course. 3. Experiments on animals. These may be of value, but are not always conclusive. 4. Chemical analysis. This is one of the most important forms of evidence, as a demonstration of the actual presence of a poison in the body carries immense weight. The poison may be discovered in the living person by testing the urine, the blood abstracted by bleeding, or the serum of a blister. In the dead body it may be found in the blood, muscles, viscera, especially the liver, and secretions. Its discovery in these cases must be taken as conclusive evidence of administration. If, however, it be found only in substances rejected or avoided from the body, the evidence is not so conclusive, as it may be contended that the poison was introduced into or formed in the material examined after its rejection from the body, or if the quantity be very minute, it will be argued that it is not sufficient to cause death. A poison may not be detected in the body, owing to defective methods, smallness of the dose required to cause death or to its ejection by vomiting, or its elimination by the excretions. 5. Conduct of suspected persons. A prisoner may be proved to have purchased poison, to have made a study of the properties and effects of poison, to have concocted medicines or prepared food for the deceased, to have made himself the sole attendant of the deceased, to have placed obstacles in the way of obtaining proper medical assistance, or to have removed substances which might have been examined. 5. Symptoms and post-mortem appearances of different classes of poisons. Whilst recognizing the fact that toxic agents cannot be accurately classified, the following grouping may, for descriptive purposes, be admitted with the view of saving needless repetition. 1. Corrosives. Characterized by their destructive action on tissues with which they come in contact. The principal inorganic corrosives are the mineral acids, the caustic alkalis, and their carbonates. The organic are carbolic acid, strong solutions of oxalic acid, and acetic acid. Symptoms Burning pain in mouth, throat, and gullet, strong acid, metallic or alkaline taste, retching and vomiting, the discharged matters containing shreds of mucus, blood, and the lining membrane of the passages. Inside of mouth corroded. There are also dysphagia, thirst, dyspnea, small and frequent pulse, anxious expression, shock. Death may result from shock, destruction of the parts, for example, perforation of stomach or duodenum, suffocation, or some weeks subsequently death may be due to cicatricial contraction of the gullet, stomach, or pylorus. Post-mortem appearances. Those of corrosion, with corrugation from strong contraction of muscular fibers, and followed by inflammation and its consequences. The mouth, gullet, and stomach, and in some cases the intestines, may be white, yellow, or brown, shriveled and corroded. The corrosions may be small, or may extend over a very large surface. Sometimes considerable portions of the lining membrane of the gullet or stomach may be discharged by vomiting or by stool. Beyond the corroded parts, the textures are acutely inflamed. The stomach is filled with a yellow, brown, or black gelatinous liquid, or black blood, and may, in rare cases, be perforated. 2. Irritants. These are substances which inflame parts to which they are applied. The class includes mineral, animal, and vegetable substances, and contains a larger number of poisons than all the other classes together. Irritants may be divided into two groups. 1. Those which destroy life by the irritation they set up in the parts to which they are applied. 2. Those which add to local irritation, peculiar or specific remote effects. The first group includes the principal vegetable irritants, some alkaline salts, some metallic poisons, etc. And the second comprises the metallic irritants, the metalloids, phosphorus and iodine, and one animal substance, cantharides. Symptoms burning pain and constriction in throat and gullet, pain and tenderness of stomach and bowels, intense thirst, nausea, vomiting, purging and tenesmus, with bloody stools, dysuria, cold skin, and feeble and irregular pulse. The vomit consists at first of the food, then it becomes bile-stained, 
and later dark coffee grounds in appearance, due to extravasation of blood from the over-distended vessels in the gastric mucous membrane. Death may occur from shock, convulsions, collapse, exhaustion, or from starvation on account of chronic inflammation of the gastrointestinal mucous membrane. Postmortem appearances. Those of inflammation and its consequences. Coats of stomach, fauces, gullet, and duodenum may be thickened, black, ulcerated, gangrenous, or sloughing. Vessels filled with dark blood ramify over the surface. Acute inflammation is often found in the small intestines, with ulceration and softening of mucous membrane. The rectum is frequently the seat of marked ulceration. 3. Poisons acting on the brain. Three classes. The opium group, producing sleep. The belladonna group, producing delirium and illusions. And the alcohol group, causing exhilaration, followed by delirium or sleep. Symptoms. Of the opium group, giddiness, headache, dimness of sight, contraction of the pupils, noises in the ears, drowsiness and confusion, passing into insensibility. Of the belladonna group, delirium, illusions of sight, dilated pupils, dry mouth, thirst, redness of skin, coma. Of the alcohol group, excitement of circulation and of cerebral functions, want of power of coordination and of muscular movement, double vision, mania, followed by profound sleep and coma. In the chronic form, delirium tremens. Postmortem appearances. In the opium group, fullness of the sinuses and veins of the brain, with the fusion of serum into the ventricles and beneath the membranes. In the belladonna group, nil. In the alcohol group, signs of inflammation, congestion of brain and membranes, fluidity of blood, long-continued rigor mortis. 4. Poisons acting on the spinal cord. Strychnine, brucine, thebaine. The leading symptom is tetanic spasm. 5. Poisons affecting the heart. These kill by sudden shock, syncope, or collapse. They comprise prussic acid, dilute solution of oxalic acid and oxalates, aconite, digitalis, strophanthus, convalaria, and tobacco. 6. Poisons acting on the lungs. These have for their type carbonic acid gas and coal gas. The fumes of ammonia are intensely irritating and may give rise to laryngitis, bronchitis, and even pneumonia. Nitric acid fumes sometimes produce no serious symptoms for an hour or more, but there may then be coughing, difficulty of breathing, and tightness in the lower part of the throat, followed by capillary bronchitis. End of section 10